Yeah, sure. I think uh, we have another uh, interesting presentation coming up on LVADs, the information about which is probably not uh, so much sunk into even a, a general practicing cardiologist. Uh, so there is a lot to hear and learn from uh, Dr. Viveka Kumar's experience with LVADs. So obviously, you know, the first uh, thing which uh, you asked the question regarding stage 4 heart failure and role of these implantable devices, especially the CRT and all, then the data, and even if you go for the ARNI data recently, that in these circumstances, ARNI and the heart failure medications also do not really do great and mortality benefit is not very significant. So this is a stage where, you know, the heart transplant or what we call artificial heart or left ventricular assist device. So we have got what we call intermediate and long-term circulatory assist devices, which are answer for this end stage heart failures. And this is the huffy in heart where, you know, no matter what you do, you can, in this picture, clearly depicts that this is how the heart failure is. And this is, uh, so we need to have, you know, intermax profiling of the patient. And we know that if we see the catchy terms like, you know, crash and burn, that is, you know, profile one critical cardiogenic shock where the patient with life-threatening hypertension, despite rapidly escalating inotropic support, critical organ hypoperfusion is there and often confirmed by worsening of acidosis and lactate levels. So these are the classes, we call it crash and burn uh, group of patients. Then there is a progressive decline group where the patients with declining function despite intravenous inotropic support may manifest with worsening of kidney function, nutritional depletion, and inability to restore the volume balance. So this is sliding on the inotropes. So they are just being there because the inotropes are being pushed up. The third profile of the patient is stable, but inotropic dependent patient. So the patient with stable blood pressure, organ function, nutrition, and symptoms on continuous intravenous inotropic support or temporary circulatory support device or both, but demonstrating repeated failure to wean from these support. And we see quite often these patients whether they are on heart failure devices, CRT, or not, then also these things will be. So definitely these group of patients, we say that as dependent stability patients, so they are dependent on significant support. And then the group of patients where there's a resting symptoms, the patient can be stabilized close to normal volume status, but experiences daily symptoms, congestion at rest, and, you know, uh, during some effort, doses of diuretic generally fluctuating at a very high level. So these are the group of patients where they are frequent flyers, so they get repeated hospitalization. And, uh, you know, these are the signs that these patients are nearing their end very soon. So again, there is a patient's group, which are, you know, group five patients who are housebound, so what we call exertion intolerant patients. So they, they cannot really exert at all. They have to be at home. And then the patient group six, which is the exertion limited patient or walking wounded. So these are the patients who would, you know, do some activity out of home, but not really comfortable being at all. So these are the, you know, named as walking wounded. And then advanced NYHA class three patients where in the placeholder for more precise specification in future, these levels of the patient who are without current or recent episodes of unstable fluid balance living comfortably with meaningful activity limited to mild physical exertion. So these are the patients where, you know, seven type of profile of the patients are there. The reason why this is important that if you look at the, you know, outcomes of these intermedics, you can see that, you know, the level is very, very gloomy and months to years, so their survival would be, you know, if the patient is in, you know, heart failure, End stage, then obviously hours to days will be the uh, you know, benefit will be they will be surviving. If the patient has got you know intermediates one to two, they will be surviving for maybe hours to weeks. Intermediates three to four weeks to months and five to seven months to years. So if you look at the you know the role of SS devices, VADs, then definitely the intermediates one to four. These are the one where they would be benefiting. And then we, in certain cases, obviously the heart transplant would be best as it's been discussed, but definitely these are the group where CRT and ICDs are not going to make any difference, but the 
as well as would definitely would be great support. So if you look at the short term, you know, mechanical circulatory assist devices, intraoral balloon pump increases cardiac output by only 15% and most of the people have got access to this, but that is not sufficient enough in majority of the patients. The patients who have got, you know, tandem heart or Ampella devices, Ampella CP 2.5 there, they will be cardiac index that gets up by 30 to 60 percent and that's reasonably good then if you have an implantable like centrimag and ecmo where there will be 100 percent full support is there but obviously these are the ones bridge to definitive therapy like left ventricular assist device or the heart transplant so short term mcs devices like centrimag and all which has got capable of six to nine liters per minute uh, eight, and this is obviously the surgically you have to implant and this is the console which you see, and it can have a biventricular support also. And ECMO, I think during COVID time, it really upsurs in patients who have got lung disease as well. Tandem heart, though it's not available out place, but this is something which is again a temporary device because you know you you can't keep it for long. Uh, but this is basically reserved mainly for patients where we are doing the you know high risk interventions in very poor patients, the you know, single surviving graft or single surviving vessel left main disease and all severe LB dysfunction. So this is something reserved for that. So we need to do something in patients like in reversible disease like COVID and all there, this to recovery was done. Sometimes we do you know assist devices for risk to decisions and then sometimes bridge to bridge. So bridge to transplant is something which was you know very common for the assist devices and because as you would know the transplant is something which is uh, not easily available. So this was the second generation you know ventricular assist devices and you can see it works on the principle of blue device so you connect it into the left ventricular apex and then this is a motor console and this goes and gets connected to the ascending aorta and then you have this pump where the you know you need to connect to the battery port that, to this uh, uh, wire so that it keeps on running forever because you can't give it a rest so the heart rate 3 had also been launched where you know a couple of years back where you know in our hospital in max healthcare uh, we did our cardiac surgeon colleagues we have implanted on the first in Asia Pacific. So this, you know, HVAD device was there that has been uh, called, really called by Medtronic. Uh, so this is the patient where the decision is very important. So we call it decision is very more important than the incision. So putting the device in is more easier, but who the patient where the things will be beneficial is very important. So if you look at the class one indication for left ventricular assist device, it is cardiogenic shock requiring mechanical assistance, refractory heart failure with continuous inotropic support, and why it's a class three to four uh, patients, you know, who are 12 months prognosis is there, progressive symptoms with maximum therapy, the patients who have got severe symptomatic hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, medically refractory angina with unsuitable anatomy for revascularization, life threatening ventricular arrhythmias despite aggressive medical and device interventions, and hypoplastic left heart and complex congenital heart disease are also something where it could be. Here. So the right heart function is something which is very, very important for the success of this therapy. Otherwise, we might need a bivac therapy. So you need to assess the, you know, the ventilatory parameters, the boundary vascular resistance, the LA pressure, acidosis, and on the preload side, volume status, renal function, diuretic response, tricuspid insufficiency, and all has to be assessed. So the one of the major limitations is that if you are just putting an LVAD, the right ventricular function has to, you know, really be supportive in that. We need to look at the parameters like tap seed and apical root annular distance and ratio of RV to LV in short axis. So bottom line is that if the right ventricular is in good condition, the adaptation and success of these devices are far better. So these left ventricular assist devices, as you could see, these the console and these the batteries where uh, you could, you know, these are four console of chargeable batteries and they keep on shifting from each other. So this is a device with the cartoon representation to that get sucked into this, this is the motor, which is a magnet deviated motor, and you can adjust the parameters of the device, how much, uh, you know, blood you want. I think the video is not running, but, uh, so here we had had, you know, significant, uh, almost, 
till now we have increased the uh, LVADs to almost uh, you know uh, 20 LVADs have been done in last uh, almost four or five years. So these are patients who was 38 years old had PCMP and put on ICD, but as we know that only the sudden cardiac death can be prevented. He went into progressive heart failure, became you know frequent flyer, and then was uh, told that he is on intraday balloon pump and he cannot survive for more than few hours. He was shifted to our hospital, and then you can see on echocardiography, this is the heart which was looking ballooned up. Then the you know LVAD was implanted, and you can see once the card LVAD was implanted, the cardiac output was improved. This is the drive line which comes out of the heart, and this uh, they have to keep the battery in the pocket. And this is how the CT autogram would look like of the ventricular assist device. And then this is the drive line, which is the most important and precious thing which we have to keep it preserved outside the body. And this is again a colored cartoon with the CT picture of the same device. And then you can see this patient who was bed bound is now joint job and doing everything and uh, has become a productive life uh, and has joined his job. Except for swimming, he's been doing everything. And since he was a journalist also and had his own media uh, cell, so he is gone back to his full activity. And this is the bag where the battery is being kept. This is another patient who was flown in from other city and had, you know, this patient after the implant has been dancing. So basically, you know, this is a surgical procedure where this is how the you know, device is implanted. You have to protect you need to uh, keep it and then connect it to the, uh, this is a more close-up view of the same. And then the wire insertion is there. You need to make it smooth and connect the conduit there. So the intracorporeal, uh, these devices, once the device is connected here, and then this uh, uh, you know, Vortex uh, tube has to be connected into the ascending aorta, and this, this goes from here till that in the ascending aorta, and the job is done. So the other patient is again, um, uh, you know, who had uh, some clot formation, and the device raised the alarm. So there, the patient had again clot removal and aortic valve repair, and HeartMed three. So HeartMed two was upgraded to HeartMed three, which is the most successful device of. Late. And the heart med three is something which has got very long, long longevity. So these are our surgical team which we did it. And uh, the other patient is again younger patient. She had you know repeated hospital stay. And uh, here you can see that the during COVID time uh, had you know INR drop and had uh, clot formation within the device. So there again the clot removal and all was done. And the optimal orientation of the inlet cannula was done, and thereafter she could be saved. So you can see on echocardiography and the fluoroscopy uh, pictures are there, which shows that. So basically, advantage of the LVAD is in patients who are not eligible for heart transplant because the age, high peripheral vascular resistance, high susceptibility to infection or rejection, or patients who have got overweights and readily available, no waiting list in these devices. So I think this is something which is going to be the future if we can, you know, bring over the complications of clot formation. Only downside is that the patient has to be on anticoagulation with MK antagonist and they have to be on the, uh, you know, keep it regularly monitored. Uh, so that's the downside. So I think uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk and go to chairperson. Thank you very much.